For the third year in a row, the city of Columbus has been named one of the top seven intelligent communities in the world by the Intelligent Community Forum. The Intelligent Community Forum, or ICF, is a New York-based international think tank that studies the world's cities to discover and then share the strategies used to create an intelligent community. In the past month, Intelligent Community Forum co-founder Lou Zaccarilla visited Columbus to review the initiatives that led to Columbus being named one of the top seven intelligent communities in the world for 2015. He will then submit his report to a large international group of experts. And in June, at the annual Intelligent Community Forum's summit in New York City, the intelligent community for 2015 will be announced. Part of Lou Zaccarilla's visit here included a roundtable meeting with business and community leaders at CTV's studio entitled Urban and Rural Planning. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm William Murdoch. I'm the executive director of the Middle Ohio Regional Planning Commission, and I'm also your moderator today for the Intelligent Communities Forum panel on urban and rural planning. So we're delighted to have a great panel here for you uh, this afternoon, and uh, we're very excited about work going on in Columbus and Central Ohio about planning for our growth. And uh, I'd like to introduce, uh, or have the panel introduce themselves, but first we have a special guest from the Intelligent Communities Forum, uh, Lou Zaccarilla. Thank you, William. It's great to be here. And uh, congratulations on being a top seven city. Well, thank you. We're looking forward to be the number one one if we can make that happen. So we. Uh, uh, glad to have you in Columbus, and hopefully you've enjoyed your visit. Very much. And uh, why don't we have our, our panelists uh, introduce themselves, and we'll start with you, Mark. Thank you, William. Thanks for having us here. Uh, Mark Wagenbrenner. I'm with uh, Wagenbrenner Development. Uh, we're a local uh, real estate development company. Uh, historically, we've specialized in revitalizing brownfields, and uh, recently, most of those brownfields are near our urban core, and uh, we've we've seen a tremendous amount of activity as we uh, as we develop some of those brownfield sites. Hi, thank you for having me. I'm Council Member Michelle Mills and I chair development as well as the Environment Committee on behalf of Columbus City Council. It's great to be here. I'm also serving on a part of the Strategic Committee for Columbus 2020 where I think a lot of the results of the Insight uh, panel will, will be very helpful, so glad to be here. Hi, my name is Holly Maddy. I'm the Executive Director of the Fairfield County Regional Planning Commission. Fairfield County is the county immediately to the southeast of Franklin County, and uh, we are a unique community as far as uh, we're on that urban-rural fringe. Uh, so we have the suburban communities of Pickerington, Canal Winchester, and the northwest corner of our county. And as you go further south, you start to approach the, the Appalachian area, and, we, and you get a much more agriculture and uh, rural area. Uh, so thank you for having me. Hi, I'm John Kim. I'm the research director for Columbus 2020, which is a economic development organization for uh, 11 county region in central Ohio. Uh, I also serve in the same role as research director for the Columbus Chamber. Thanks for having me. Great. Well, welcome everybody. Welcome, Lou. And today is a conversation about uh, our region's future here in central Ohio and a, a really uh, innovative, we think revolutionary project called Insight 2050, which is really looking at some of the big changes that we're expecting in Central Ohio through 2050. Uh, we, we know demographically here that we're expected to add about a half million people through 2050, 300,000 jobs. Uh, at the same time, we're having some pretty major shifts in demographics, a doubling of our senior population, a huge increase in youth population. At the same time, development trends are changing with more walkability, more city services being requested. Uh, it's, it's a whole new world for us as we prepare for uh, this growth in our demographics. And what we think uh, we have here is a project called Insight 2050 for the region to get ahead of that, uh, using technology and smart tools to analyze that, that growth and to uh, allow us to plan better. So today we wanted to talk a little bit about Insight 2050 and then our panelists can fill in uh, how it's affecting their thinking and their work and their, uh, their organizations and what they're seeing as uh, Columbus uh, and our rural and uh, regional area deals with some of the growth challenges and the opportunities that come with it. So Insight 2050 is a public-private partnership uh, between uh, local governments with the Middle High Regional Planning Commission, uh, the business community with Columbus 2020, uh, the Urban Land Institute, which is a balance of public and private folks interested in uh, good development practices. And we've all come together around this question of, if we're going to grow, 
how do we maintain our quality of life? How do we get ahead of some of the challenges? And how should we do this? And I, I think one, one good way to think about it, um, when we go out and we've been talking to the region about this, they've told us uh, that the region isn't looking necessarily for a regional plan. And as the regional planning director, I'm, I'm always like, oh, okay, well, yeah. what, what should we be doing? And uh, Lou, you'll be thrilled with the answer. And the answer is they've almost unanimously said, give us the tools, give us the metrics, give us objective information so that our local governments can make really strong uh, and informed land use decisions. Uh, but the kicker is they want to be able to do that in the context of their neighbors so that Columbus and Fairfield County and all of uh, these communities can project uh, their own growth to make decisions about their own growth in context of the region. And uh, what Insight 2050 does is uh, use a pretty robust computer model called Rapid Fire that Peter Calthorpe and Associates, uh, an international firm, helped us to develop that looks at a range of scenarios of growth uh, and some really key, uh, key uh, metrics like health, transportation, infrastructure, local government, uh, funding, uh, air quality, energy, and, and so on, so that we can look as a region at how our growth uh, could affect us depending on how we develop. And then for our local communities, they can look at their own, own growth and our business community can look at that growth. And, uh, so this, this project has come together uh, to help us do that. And uh, what it's done in so far is it started a, a conversation in Central Ohio as uh, we've been thinking about uh, other regions and how they've grappled with growth and some of the problems they see. Uh, here we want to use good data, good information, good tools so that we can add a half million people but still have a great quality of life. We can add uh, 300,000 homes and 300,000 jobs, still have uh, decent traffic and a vibrant economy and healthy local governments. Uh, and so uh, the promise in this tool is that it allows us to, to get ahead of that, not through a regional plan, but through information informing these thousands of decisions that developers and communities are making. So we're very excited to, to share uh, uh, this project with the Intelligent Communities Forum, and I think it really strikes us as a, a way to reinvent and revolutionize the way we approach uh, planning for our future. Uh, so what we thought we'd do is open it up to our panelists and allow them to talk about how this tool is impacting their work and their communities and how they're planning uh, for that growth. So if you're comfortable, we can Dive right in. Absolutely. <laughs> well, well, great. Uh, so I, the, the first question, I, I, I think we'll have each of our panelists answer, but um, how, how is Insight 2050 and some of these big implications uh, really playing into your decisions in your organizations? And uh, Councilwoman Mills, maybe we, we start with the City of Columbus, who's been such a key partner in this project and pushing us to think about this. And in your own nonprofit work, too, I know this has uh, mm -hmm. been a big challenge. So. <laughs> How is Insight 2050 really uh, uh, affecting the city and its, its future? Well, I th it has a lot of implications. And, and when we talk about investment and the tools we use to leverage businesses, not only just to support them in their expansion, but also new businesses and their growth and choosing Columbus. And so how do we bring in new businesses and what are those areas of where we want to introduce them that can spark growth and neighborhood revitalization because in a lot of communities there's a need to have an anchor in some communities and we can use that as a tool to say this community could use that and it sparks a lot of other changes when we bring or expand a business in a particular area or neighborhood. It also gives us um, the insight in terms of what type of housing people are choosing and so when we partner with folks on multi-use facilities and residential, what will they be using? What market will they be attracting? Because we need the housing stock for those new residents. We have um, two major ways of attracting new residents, and that growth is easily um, identified through the students at The Ohio State University choosing to remain in the city of Columbus. And so we have a pipeline, if you will, of new residents that we have to figure out how to keep here and engage in the city in a way that makes for their quality of life, while at the same time balancing our aging population, as Insight 2050 points out. How do we engage them and continue to make sure that our housing stock is growing with their needs or shrinking with their needs, where you talk about large suburban communities that we may, may have invested um, a lot of in our outlining areas, you see a lot of single family homes where now there's a lot of need for apartments and smaller and maintenance free living and things like that. 
At the same time, there's infrastructure needs, as you talked about. The other interesting um, part about this is thinking about places like Fairfood, who have a mix of urban and agriculture, where now we have to now consider agriculture in the urban areas. Mm -hmm. So where their problem is now with more traffic congestion and some of the urban challenges, ours is now how do we incorporate agriculture? So it's almost interesting to see this sort of flip and, and to, so we can learn as a region from one another, there is certain things they can talk to us about as it relates to how do you blend the two and there's a lot of lessons that we can share. So I think as Columbus makes a lot of those decisions, whether it's land use or others, we become the pioneer and the leader in the region to help inform some of the other communities because we all, as you know, are successful in the region is successful and not just one city or one other area, but as the entire region grows and those lessons can be shared, we all benefit. Speaking of the, the rural area, Fairfield County is just to the southeast of Columbus, and it's growing, but it's rural. Yeah. Holly, how has this affected your work? I think it really complements what we've already been doing. We have a county plan that we've had for several years now, and it um, actually took into effect um, and promotes agricultural preservation with development within urban service areas. Um, so this takes this the next step and says, here's how we do this, and here's what's coming down the road, and let's focus that um, in our urban cores, um, in our villages, in our um, so cities that we have, um, and let's preserve that agricultural base that we have to uh, make sure that we are um, protecting the resources that we need as a community. Um, so I think it's just a next step of, of what we've been doing in the past, so I'm very happy to, to be working with it. Great, so from the, the business perspective, uh, Jung, uh, how, how is that translating into your work uh, with businesses and business retention and recruitment? Insight 2050 touches on economic development and, and business interests in a lot of ways. I think the council member touched on some of them. Uh, a big part of this is workforce. You know, the demographic changes that Insight 2050 talks about also mean workforce changes. We have certain industries like manufacturing, the skilled trades, um, even professional services like insurance where the average age of the workforce is in the 50s. And those people are gonna retire soon, so who's gonna take their place? And you have some natural growth from the millennial generation, but it's also about keeping Columbus as a, an attractive place uh, for people to, to do business, to live and play. Um, so hopefully you can retain some of that talent, attract additional talent to, to fill that workforce gap that's gonna be coming our way. Uh, Another part of uh, Insight 2050 is talking about more compact development, uh, what Holly's talking about in Fairfield County. You know, from our perspective, you know, obviously open space, environment, agriculture are important, uh, but land is also valuable from a manufacturing and logistics standpoint. These are large scale users. To have that land not go to waste for sprawling residential or retail development, and instead have some of that available as well as the infrastructure capacity around that, for key manufacturing logistics employers is important for us as well. You know, uh, one of the findings of Insight 2050 said that depending on how we grow, uh, we could, uh, if we, we grew a little bit more compact to meet the market and to, to use these tools to let us plan for that market, we could save 220 miles of agricultural land, 220 square miles, uh, which for us is the, the current footprint of the city of Columbus. So. A half million people done different ways could have some pretty stunning impacts on agricultural land and our ability to uh, expand uh, some of our industries. Uh, you know, uh, Mark Jung mentioned um, uh, housing and compact development and places for workers to go, and that's your business. So how, how is this uh, being felt on the ground? Well, I think um, all of us residents here in Columbus, I'm happy to say we're off to, I would say, a great start. I mean, we've really, since the recession, um, the uptick in in interest and in, in really all facets. It was pretty much led by residential and um, you know, it's just incredible what we've seen over the last 10 years and and, and I, I know a councilwoman Mills, we all are, are very uh, always fighting to keep our, our youth here, but I don't know what's happened in the last 10 years, but um, our ability and, and there's such a good vibe and it's, uh, I think we say in the office, uh, in, in, people are inexplicably content <laughs> living in and around uh, town. And, and so that momentum is really kind of, um, you know, and, and I think as a region, we always try to like 
you know, phrase it or coin it. And I think more and more we just got to step back and let it happen. But, you know, you look at the vibe that we have in our short north and we, we constantly look at the short north, but it's kind of, it's swelled well beyond that now. And, and so, you know, we're getting more than our share of young people. We recently pursued a national tenant, you know, Stone Brewing, and um, it came down to the end. Unfortunately, we didn't get them. But to hear national, um, you know, placement people say, look, you know, um, these folks were out of Chicago and San Diego saying, and you know, our recent studies are showing that Columbus is stacking up against all cities in this region, and it's because of its affordability and ease of living, you know, and those are phrases that don't typically work with youth, and yet, you know, you talk to our youth, they're, they're really excited about living here. So um, we're just, I mean, we couldn't be more excited about, you know, the opportunities that are at hand, and, and we're really seeing a reverse, and we've seen this in other markets that have a lot of, of, of urban grit and, and places like, you know, Austin and, and Nashville and even Charlotte where jobs are now following the kids and they're coming back into town. And I know recently projects like Grandview Yard where, you know, 3,700 jobs are coming back. I mean, who would have guessed five years ago that we'd see this kind of movement? And, and we can tell you, you know, being in the market all the time, the amount of businesses, particularly the creative businesses that are relying on, on the younger workforce are, are aggressively pursuing sites within our urban core. So, you know, to see all this happen since since the recession is really uh, is really remarkable. So, I think we have so many great things to look forward to. Is is uh, hopefully uh, all the things that have been laid out in, in your findings are, are are proven, and we have a really good stock of, um, you know, and cost wise, really uh, a good ability to turn a lot of these underutilized sites in our in our urban areas uh, into really exciting reuse and that are going to be right in the vein of what you were describing. And that's that's another key finding that we've we've seen. We we now with this tool we know that we're expecting a billion square feet of non-residential space either to be redeveloped or needed to accommodate our growth. And for us we think one of the the best opportunities might be commercial sites that need to be re redeveloped or brownfields or infill sites. And I, I, this is a, a trend that uh, the region's already experiencing, but, but now we have some hard data showing that this could actually save us money and this might be a way to accommodate the market. And I, I'd like to open it to the panelists. You know, is this what you're seeing around the region? It's happening in rural and, and in urban areas too. I would say absolutely yes. I don't want to take over. <laughs> but being at the center of where development happens, we. Um, try really to look at some of our commercial buildings. We've um, tried to really aggressively go after some of vacant and abandoned properties and breathe life back into them. And we're getting a lot of ask about large amounts of space. And so we do have some commercial facilities that are primed for that and just need a new life and, and to be reused. And again, what that does a lot of times for us is in an area where there's blight that may exist when it comes to a commercial facility, we can now add a business there. There's jobs right in the community where people can walk to because that's the other side of it. People want a walkable community, alternative transportation. And so when we can do that with a commercial building, there's several wins from that. There's neighborhood vitalization that sparked. There is walkability and the things that are attracting the workforce that we need because it's one thing to have a business and another thing to not have the workforce. And so we can offer all of that ease of living sort of things as Mark talked about whether it's getting to work with ease, getting around and getting to the grocery store, having access to all daily living around where they work and live all together, I think then we're smarter for it. And I think with a lot of reuse of the commercial facilities, warehouse space, whether for logistics or not, I think it goes a long way because there's several wins for a neighborhood and for the entire city when we're able to do that with a lot of our commercial structures. Just a lot of downtown redevelopment is in like our city of Lancaster, which is the county seat. And um, just seeing that transform over the last couple of years has been amazing to me. Um, we have had several restaurants go in. Um, we have had some housing that units that are going in. And you drive down there on a Friday night and you can't find a parking spot. And before, in 2005, when the 33 bypass went in, everybody said, downtown is done. It's not going to make it. And you go down there and you can't find a parking spot. And that's just great to, to see. <laughs> You know, I just can I say something, Wayne? You, you all look surprised that this is happening. Um, <laughs> and you know, I <laughs> we're, we're very modest. Here. I, I, yeah. no, so, I noticed that. Well, let, yeah. take it from a New Yorker. Yeah. <laughs> You've got some things to brag about. Um, but I, 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 I'm struck by um, the emphasis, and I've heard it 
because the last few, two days I've been here, you know, looking around, and, and they've been great, you know, showing me the city and stuff. Um, but the quality of life is is a focus area, mm -hmm. and you know what you invest in, you get in return. And and to think about and to plan for, and then to begin to experience quality of life um, as a strategic goal, is really what's going to drive the economies and societies in the in the 21st century. So. Um, I think Columbus kind of got onto that uh, maybe sooner than most, and you're beginning to see the rewards. Uh, I love Mark's phrase. I wrote it down that you're uh, inexplicably content. Um, and that's a, that's a, I guess the modest way to uh, say we're pretty proud of what, you know. But, uh, <laughs> but, I th but I think there's something to that. There, there, is, there is a certain point with this stuff where, um, in Columbus's case, I'll speak to it because I guess it's my observation from, from 20,000 feet and now on the ground. Um, you know, Gary Cavan and his group on the tech side have really laid the new railroad in. I mean, you've got the foundation. Technology is not going to be an issue. Broadband access is not an issue here, and it is in a lot of other cities. You know, I spent time over at the supercomputer today with that group, and what's, what's being put in there to connect all the different research centers and to bring all this knowledge in on the new railroad is going to yield something that's going to be quite profound. Uh, the, qu the question I think you have to ask yourself for the workforce and for development purposes is really how do you overlay that with this what we call intelligent community structure and that's the kind of stuff that's like um, you know it's like lightning in a bottle you know as a developer you, you probably know that or as, a, as, as planners a counselor you know that but what we see happening is that you you put in this infrastructure you know, you've got the technology piece, now you're putting the other pieces in. You've got OSU, you know, a great knowledge factory. And then you, you structure it so that, it sounds like a contradiction, but you structure it so that the spontaneous can occur, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And it, it's, again, it sounds a bit like a contradiction, but that's really what you want as you continuously build this ladder for a creative economy, uh, an intelligent community. Because quality of life is a state of mind. Um, I, you know, I, I spoke with someone after a presentation today at, about autonomous vehicles, one of the professors there, and he said, you know, I used to go to New York because I used to like to eat. I like to eat. And I used to go to New York and go to restaurants. He says, you know what, last couple of years, I stay right here. Uh, inexplicably content, but, you know, the, the, the pathway is to the stomach, right? Yeah, exactly. but, that, that, but, but for me, I wrote, I wrote that yeah. down. Yeah. That's a quality of life statement, and I, I think... Um, that's the kind of stuff that builds the, the momentum that um, I think yields the results of, of your planning. Well, and you know, the, uh, the, as we're bearing the seeds of our investments, um, a lot of our communities are, are facing this where we, we've made ourselves a more attractive place, a higher quality of life place, and we're getting requests for different types of development, different types of uh, things to accommodate for the workforce. Communities are getting asked to do more than they've ever done before. Um, and so uh, using some of those tools in Insight 2050, we're really trying to be able to, to arm everybody with ways to talk about it objectively because these things really can spark emotions where developers say they want this and communities say, well, our zoning doesn't allow it and residents say this. And all we're trying to do is throw information out and say, hey, let's use the same data here. Let's talk about what this means. And yeah. um, so I, I think it might be useful to, to talk a little bit about maybe the how we, we see these changes tying into quality of life and uh, what, what changes are you seeing? Maybe, maybe Jung, from a workforce perspective, what are businesses asking for as a result of this? So. From an economic development perspective, you know, quality of life can seem like a, a fuzzy, kind of heartwarming term that doesn't match up with the, you know, the cold, hard bottom line of uh, doing business. But, you know, when you put that aside and see what businesses are actually doing in this community, you know, you have uh, the interest of companies like a Nationwide, uh, Columbia Gas, L Brands, you know, others. They've put in money into projects like the Columbus Commons, Scioto Mile. The fact that we have the Wexner Center for the Arts, you know, going a couple of decades back, but, you know, that was partly driven by the interest of, well, our workers are going to look for this kind of amenity when they move here from in New York or in L.A. Uh, so I think they do recognize it, and you know, even outside the city, you look at Dublin and Bridge Street. Uh, that's partly driven by Cardinal Health and OCLC. The fact that they're looking at their community and saying, "Okay, we've been a typical suburban campus. 
uh, residential single family lot development kind of place for a while, but now we have to change because our workforce is going that way. So they're actively interested in, in that new sort of development that's more urban, that creates a greater sense of place. And we're seeing it across the region, you know, in Lancaster and Marysville, Delaware, and so on. So I, I think businesses do recognize it. They might not completely admit it, but, <laughs> but it's happening. Yeah. But, and, and the other interesting thing is, though, that when that begins to happen, you, you can't even measure it, um, it, is, it because it also yields uh, social capital. I mean, that's, you know, that's the measurement that, you know, my organization and others are really starting to try to, to address. Uh, I remember uh, we sat down with the mayor in Seoul, uh, Korea, a couple years ago, and he was actually a graduate of the John F. Kennedy School of Government. And he took out this big spreadsheet, and he explained to me why they were so robust with their technology, because if you've ever been to Seoul, you can actually go to a kiosk on the subway and for 30 cents get your real estate deed or your, or your permits, fishing permits. And I asked him, I said, wow, that's an enormous, sure. yeah, no kidding, on the subway, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> right. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> but, I, but I asked him, I said, why, do you, why did you make this investment? What's, and, and he actually had a spreadsheet, you know, one of those things, and he took it out. And he said, um, he said, for every two hours, I can save someone from interfacing with government. Um, that's two hours they can spend with their church, with their social group, with their family, or if they want, starting another business or taking a class. And he had this stuff all mapped out. So he, you know, he had a phrase, uh, quality of life is capital. And so it, there, is, there is hard yield on that. There's hard ROI on that. Um. Yeah, I would say, so there is influences in terms of our intentionality on quality of life. We had to make some policy decisions and that how we use bad tax dollars and what does that do for some of the social features of our community, whether it's the arts, whether it's our social services, so our safety nets are, are all together because every member in the community should share in that increase of quality of life. And so we've been very intentional from a policy standpoint to make sure that we're doing that. In addition to that, when you think about the newness of things like food trucks, we've had to embrace that. That's a whole new realm. But at the beginning of that is an entrepreneur. There's someone that is going to invest in a city who could lead to a more bricks and mortar down the road and that early investment and how they've experienced starting their business is the same experience we want everyone to have when they're thinking about choosing business in the city of Columbus because that quality of life, how they were able to maneuver and navigate is all important. But again, for us, the intentionality from the city side to make sure quality of life increases is from every neighborhood throughout the city of Columbus. And so we may see some uh, neighborhoods growing at a different pace. You see the vibrancy in the short north. But we want everybody to feel just as vibrant about their part of the city as well. And so we have to be very intentional about quality of life. The other side of our investments and changes that we make with the bed tax dollars and how we invest those also speaks to how we bring in visitors because that becomes our social capital when someone visits our city and they decide that they want to locate here and they may have other thoughts about not just moving here but bringing their business here that comes into play and in how they feel the city is in terms of welcoming people so we want to make sure that whether they interact with someone at the airport or they interact with someone at a hotel that they can have the same conversation about our city and feeling good about our city wherever they travel throughout the city of Columbus and so it's about the residents as well as it is about the visitors so our um, increase um, in visibility as a city through Experience Columbus is just as critical and making sure they have the tools to talk about it you heard Mark talk about us courting other businesses the way we do that is is different even now we're showing off things that are more social capital because I can't say to someone well bring your visitors here your business here we have the Statue of Liberty, not to pick on you or anything. But, <laughs> but we do have great people. That's the asset of this city. And so social capital is one of our greatest assets. And so it is what brings business here, is what keeps them here. It's the experience of Columbus. And I think that our, our capital continues to grow in that area because we've been very intentional about that experience of Columbus. Yeah, well, and that's true. And I think your neighborhood pride program mm -hmm. uh, is brilliant because it reinforces at a very, very specific neighbor, house-to-house -house level, yeah. this whole idea that this really is a community where there's quality of life, where, you know, this business or, or this, this home has really sort of taken it up to the next level. And, and, that, and that, that has sort of an effect throughout the city. Yes. 
think. Uh, you don't have a Statue of Liberty, no, but uh, <laughs> I, was, I, just, I just took something off my bucket list. I stood on the 50-yard line in the shoe. Oh. So uh, I'm ready to move here. All right. <laughs> that was an experience. Yeah, that's right. The experience of Columbus. A lot of optimism. Yeah. Right. On the, the tourism type thing too is that you know if you're in Columbus it's just a short drive through our county down to Hawking Hills and to other areas that have a lot of attraction for um, people so you know if you live in Columbus you can have a nice weekend trip uh, without going too far and and that stuff so I think that's another quality of life um, aspect to the area. Yeah, you know, with, with some of our regional competitors, they brag about, well, we're two hours from the mountains and two hours from the ocean. And we're two hours from the mountains and we're two hours from Lake Erie. And we, we have the same amenities, but uh, our modesty sometimes here, we, we've, uh, what inexplicable contentness, I think, is our <laughs> phrase of the day. We, we forget that sometimes because we, we've got a high quality of life. And that, that is something that we, we should brag about. Um, you know, thinking about um, knowledge uh, workers and uh, some of these demographic changes we're seeing, they have to live somewhere. And so we're, we're seeing this explosion of demand for different types of housing. And maybe, Mark, you could talk about it because you're seeing it at the high end and the affordable housing end. And what Yeah, I think, I mean, across the board, it, you know, you, the study does a great job of, of kind of um, predicting and, you know, kind of explaining um, what's happening and, and I, we don't know what happened and when but clearly particularly the Millennials are, are really driven to an urban experience and um, we you know we were really fortunate to have um, not only the ground but you know a really good start I mean our, you know when you look at our, our urban neighborhoods and and not even urban just you know <laughs> our, our local food scene is really good and so a lot of the things that drive uh, the trends on a larger level we're already kind of in the works here naturally. And so for a city of our size, uh, you know, I, I think food's a good example. We do food really well. And, and so all of a sudden, you know, you have these urban pockets that have enough going on, not just, you know, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, but at all times during the week that, you know, are, are so easy to capitalize on. So from a real estate standpoint, we probably can't, and, and there's been several articles here recently, that we, we probably couldn't build enough in and around those areas that are walkable. And we're starting to see areas like, you know, Lancaster's a good example, Bridge Street, their intentions of building walkable communities in these suburbs are, are key because that that's really driving. And, and what's really exciting is the echo boomers, the, the parents, as that generation does not want to age as traditional generations do, youth always sets trends in our country. And it's their kids that have really started this movement, but the energy and you know the the you know being able to walk and really you know get integrated into a uh, an urban community that in, in our case and most of ours are very diverse I mean there's something you know totally different than the experience you had in the suburbs and as we've we've doing been doing these urban projects now for seven or eight years and we learned early like you know forget marketing in traditional ways the best thing we can do is host parties and let people come down and bring whoever they want and step back and let folks integrate because what people are really wanting when they come back to these urban neighborhoods is the whole experience of really, you know, getting to know your neighbors and and you will know your neighbors because <laughs> we are building houses that historically in the suburbs when there were 70 foot lots we're doing it now, you know, our standards 20 foot wide and uh, oftentimes we're attaching them and you know there's we see trends coming that I think are really going to allow us to even with land cost and our ability to or you know our, our we really have to kink things tight you know ur, you know residential elevators and, and and it really started in um, seaside communities with new codes I mean the quality of residential elevators and now we can take a 20 foot footprint go up three stories put a very affordable and functional residential elevator in it and you know the the cream de la right now is roof decks and so we're seeing the in larger markets but when you can take an empty nester get them up on a roof there's no place to ponder your next move than looking out over the city lights and maybe a fire pit in front of you so those are some of the amenities we're seeing in other markets that we're going to replicate here that i think are going to lead to even more acceptance of a lot of people moving back to these urban areas yeah you know we're expecting our our senior population to, to double and I, I think what's interesting about this new senior uh, population is it's, it's not all about providing care services. It's actually could, could lead to 
uh, more demand for housing products in a different way, building off broadband. It could be an entrepreneurial boom for this region as people are retiring and looking for their, their next business. And um, I'm, I'm curious about the panel. What, from an aging perspective, um, what, what are you seeing out there and what are our trends? Um, we have, um, we keep moving into the, to different scenarios. Um, I think mostly just the, the condo development is what we're seeing mostly in Fairfield County. Um, and then trying to, to integrate uh, that into our, our smaller downtowns. Um, that's pretty much what we've been seeing on that end. Well, certainly, um, I want to be one of those aging population members, <laughs> right. first and foremost. <laughs> I want to be that. But even as I think about myself, which in, I hope, a lot of rooms, I'm not considered aging population, but in terms of caring for uh, a lot more space as opposed to getting out and experiencing life, I think you'll see a lot more of that with the aging population. It is not staying at home. It's getting out and experiencing life. And so we have to adjust because that becomes a population growth and uh, managing congestion and all of that, and I think you'll see a bit of that. I think from a social service standpoint, where we're investing in home repair uh, programs, that as those decisions are made, where the aging population is moving into more of a condo situation, our home repair programs may look a little differently than they have in the past. Um, and I think you'll see a cycling of generations moving into some of our communities. I'll uh, pick on one neighborhood, particularly uh, Clintonville. And thinking about Clintonville, most uh, housing stock doesn't turn over for several years, decades even, in Clintonville. And so I think the need for engaging the next generation of those homeowners is going to be critical for that neighborhood. They're going to need to have a more um, millennial type of living in Clintonville that will then make that person say, I love this neighborhood, I don't want to move out of it, but I want a house to raise children in. So I could buy the house that the person is now moving out of who now wants a condo to sort of downsize their living. But in Clintonville, having that um, combination of housing stock is going to be critical to that neighborhood because it is a typically an older neighborhood where the housing stock turns are maybe 20, 30 years, you would oh. say. And so, you know, how do we build our next generation of neighborhood folks in Clintonville if we don't have housing stock that they would take advantage of now? The other thing that we are now seeing is when you talk about multifamily, you know, having our neighbors, our civic associations and our leaders in our neighborhoods think about renters being different than what the traditional stereotypical thought about renters are because now you have a whole nother mix and those integrations of those two types of uh, home uh, types of residents not being homeowners is going to be something we'll have to manage and educating our civic associations about the diversity and integration of those generations is going to be critical because the housing stock will need to be in all of those neighborhoods because the aging population may not want to leave their neighborhood, just want to live differently. The neighborhood I live in actually um, is a single family neighborhood where I am and then immediately connected to it as a condo unit. Um, and actually my mother-in-law moved from Connecticut to move to the condos so she could live right there. And, um, and so we all, you know, it's, it's a community that, that serves all the different ages and then the school is just right down the street. So uh, there are different ways that, that um, you can look at that and not in Fairfield County, but I know in, in the Columbus area, there is a, a community that is for the lower income population that has single family and then some cottages that grows into for uh, when they get to that next step, and then an assisted living type facility all in a campus area to age in place. Yeah, it's interesting, Wayne, because, again, you know, what they're saying reinforces what, what we spend a lot of time looking at, and that is that um, people really want community. Um, we, we had this experience in sort of the post-industrial phase of America where people were just getting out as fast as they could, and, and guess what? They got, they got lonely. Mm -hmm. They got isolated. Mm -hmm. uh, Facebook is the fourth largest country on earth population-wise for a reason. Uh, pe people, are, people seek community. So um, what we like to say at the Intelligent Community Forum is that we're just giving a new voice to the old truths. And, and, and one of them is that people in density do things that are very, very great and human. They do bad things too, of course, but they, that's the human experience. But when, when they're closer together in one way or another and they feel like they're connected to a place and they feel like they're connected to a familial 
uh, intention, um, great things happen. And interestingly enough, they happen economically. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the country of Bhutan famously measures gross domestic happiness, not, not gross domestic product. And you've had study after study come out uh, talking about how well people perform when, economically when they're content, when they feel content in their neighborhoods, in their homes. So this idea, again, of quality of life, young, as you were saying, is not something that the business people should move away from, but just quite the opposite, because it affects economic performance. Uh, and, and every study that we look at says that. So that, that's, a, that's a good thing, because it's, it's going to make our homes better, I think. And I think we see that when we have you know, the businesses that we're trying to court come visit mm -hmm. uh, Columbus and other parts of the region. You know, they're trying to get a sense of that quality of life beyond the numbers, the, the taxes, the cost of doing business. What is it about this region? And, uh, you know, a lot of them want to meet with not just other companies, but the educational institutions, some of the other organizations, governments in town. They're trying to get a sense of, you know, what we we're talking earlier about the social capital. Mm -hmm. How does this place work? Mm -hmm. How do people work together? Jung had mentioned it too, uh, but it, our corporate community has has caught on to this in a big way. And uh, when you're thinking of the the adage now that workers don't um, uh, move for the job, they move for the community, and then they find the job. Um, some of our, our big hometown corporations have really caught on to that and said, okay, if that's the case, we need to uh, help invest in these projects. And what, from Nationwide to Cardinal to Chase, I could keep going. They've invested in real estate development near their campuses or uh, close to where uh, uh, their employees, their, their future employees are living or their current employees right. want to live so that they can, can help stoke the fire there. Yeah, yeah. actually I, I had a chance to visit the co-laboratory um, uh, experience or business actually, in, uh, which is incubator housed in Battelle, but it's, uh, it's seven companies, seven of the larger companies here. and. Um, yeah, what, what, I, what I found there was exactly that, that this is a collaboration among seven of the big companies here. And what I suspect is going to result from that is something that's e equally important, I think, for, for economic development is that you don't have to, I don't think Columbus is going to have to look outside to bring companies in anymore and give away the store. I, I think you're going to have a continuous homegrown movement here. Mm -hmm. You're going to have startups. You're going to have all kinds of stuff coming out of Tech Columbus and these places. And again, I, you know, you talk about population growth, you're going you're to have business growth. You're going to have, you know, the, I think real estate expansion that's going to be significant. And it's all going to be homegrown, so you don't have to worry about them leaving. We, we'd like a little bit of the, uh, a, a good jump start with some of these bigger companies moving in, and that's always hard to recruit. But we're already seeing, um, you know, the trend that we've seen is, how, you know, a lot of the stuff coming off the West Coast, particularly out of, you know, programmers and, so, you know, the, the hot thing is like some of these more creative and we don't have a lot of old warehouses spaces because we, you know, we're, we're not that old of a city, but like schools, you know, you buy these old schools and put in incubation space and there's a lot of, um, you know, groups of programmers and it's not traditional office space and, you know, there's a, there's a growing you know, when you have a space with a little creativity to it, man, it goes like that. And and you know, they're they're you know they're they're so flexible. They're moving in and out, and you know the the coffee shops in those areas. It's really everybody's you know uh, parlor, and that's where people go to meet. And you know, so there's a really good vibe going on. And and again, I think one thing that really I think, and you hear it a lot in the word collaboration, but it is unbelievable. I mean, I, I spent some time in Chicago, and it's a great place, but. I mean, in, in, not, in, in the development industry is a really good example. I mean, in most towns, you'll get developers that are so competitive that when you have somebody that could potentially be a threat downstream, there's no effort to help them. <laughs> there's a, more of an effort to crush them before they get started. And I mean, it is unbelievable how uh, much, you know, there's a sharing of information, you know, even generationally older developers that were in the industry. I mean, there is a real want and desire to do things the right way. And, um, and you know, it's just, you, know, you just don't typically see that. And, and, um, and it carries on into all other facets. I mean, it's when we're, you know, it's amazing how many times that we've been challenged as a growing company. And, you know, you pick up the phone and you call somebody, Bob Walter, or, you know, and, and the guys that have started multi-billion dollar corporation is as accessible as guys like that are. So there is a real, I mean, our, our, our founding fathers and the people that have kind of set up, 
you know, the titans, let's say, of this town are more accessible, I would argue, than any titans in any town. And there is a want to see this thing continue. And Mr. Wexner and, and our mayor, Mayor Coleman, and the coordination between our mayor and, it, and the council, I mean, you know, we, we face challenging situations we're doing developing other markets. And what's great about Columbus is if you have the support of, of council and the mayor, everything's challenging and things are more bureaucratic, but you know you can, you're gonna get results in the end if that support's there. And, and, I, and it's just, you know, it, it's exhilarating that, that kind of support you get. And, you know, there's, it's, it's so much easier to swim with the current and the current continues to grow more and more swift around here. And it's, it's really, it's an easy place to do business and very rewarding. One of the, uh, the things that we see that our technology backbone is enabling is uh, for us to not just have fiber as an infrastructure system, but then to build off of that with transportation. And uh, the Insight 2050 project tells us that our transportation needs are changing. People want lots of options. They want lots of options on their phone. They want lots of options in their housing. Now they want lots of options in their transportation. And having the technology available to respond to that and also having the tools like Insight 2050 so we, we know what people are looking for and we know how to project the costs, so critical. Mm -hmm. And so we, in the uh, Columbus area, we've seen an explosion of car sharing technologies and bike sharing technologies enabled by the city, uh, which ties into the knowledge workforce. Um, uh, we've also uh, seen people uh, uh, looking differently at transportation and we're very proud. Uh, recently, our major transit uh, corporation, CODA, the planning group, Morpsey, and the city of Columbus's thoroughfare plan, they're all working together using the same data to plan for transportation and to plan around this, this workforce. And uh, we were lauded for doing something that maybe we should have been doing all along in, the dis in our uh, hometown newspaper uh, last week, saying, this is great. We, we need to have these groups not working in silos. And I think having the data and the technologies really helped us uh, to break, break down those, those silos. Well, congratulations. I mean, the unification of data, is a, it's a big deal. Yeah. Yeah, and you can, you can do a lot of things with it, so. Yeah. Um, the, the, one other thing I wanted to just observe um, in terms of that rural-urban piece, and uh, again, I'm here to ask questions, so it, it's more of a question, mm -hmm. but I, I was at the Waterman Farm today, and, it was, mm -hmm. and I was just sitting, and I was out there, and I'm like, wow, this is, this is like a, a farm in the middle of the city. It, it was sort of, a, mm -hmm. it was sort of symbolic of you know sort of the nature of the place the rural urban balance yeah. and um you know I, I, and i was just wondering um is is that something that that people in columbus feel i mean do they feel connected to rural roots or rural experiences definitely in fairfield county <laughs> we have that that connection um and i think that um as the residents move to those areas in the, the, that fringe area, I, I think they're, they're connecting to it and, and understanding it better. Um, to give an example of the two communities coming together, the two types of, of urban and rural coming together, uh, we have an active transportation plan that we put together. Morpsey helped us put it together several years ago. And um, we were planning for um, bicycles throughout our county, through our agricultural areas. And it was the first time that I recall that we brought together a farmer and someone who was riding a bike to the same table. And it was the most interesting conversation that we had. And it was amazing to see the two groups work together. Um, when the, the farmer came in at first saying, I don't want the bicyclists on my road. And then all of a sudden saying, well, wait, if we have bicycles on the road, maybe we can widen our road, and then maybe that helps us get our, our farming equipment down the road as well. Um, maybe um, if we have the bicycles coming through our area, they can stop and they can have an education session on our farm and start learning about the farming process that they might not have learned about before they rode their bicycle through our area. So very interesting conversations of, of how those two communities have come together. Yeah. And, but I, and I was also thinking just about what, <clears throat> what you're doing to, again, when we talk about homegrown, just the agricultural base here. Mm -hmm. And again, taking it from smart to intelligent, mm -hmm. as I always say. 
So again, you know, leveraging it for economic gain because, you know, I, John, who was out at uh, Waldman Farm, you know, for, I guess he works for OSU. Um, you know, he's, he's a knowledge worker, effectively, the way he was describing mm -hmm. how he manages his Jersey uh, cows and, and the, the work that they're doing there. Um, it's knowledge work. You know, it's next industry forward-looking oh, really? stuff, yeah. and it leverages yeah. all that data that you were talking about that's, that's coming in. Yeah. Oh, it's um, major. Yeah. We also have an agriculture economic development plan that we put together, and it's a way to connect our farmers to our um, processors to our consumers, and the, part of that calls for a... Um, a food hub to be formulated in downtown Lancaster to help aggregate food products because individual farmers cannot sell to an institutional use because they can't grow enough on their own. But if you aggregate them and bring them together, all of a sudden you have the quantity that you need, the consistency and the, the um, reliability that they might not have from the individual farmers on their own. And we're actually um, entering into a next phase of that as far as um, trying to identify a location, working with our land bank to, to get a, a um, building to support that and um, start to create a, a food incubator type um, with a commercial kitchen um, and a food uh, business incubation center in downtown Lancaster. So yes, there are business opportunities with that. My because I know if I start down this road, I'm going to for at least two hours. <laughs> right. I could go two hours on this topic easily. Um, but it is, you know, when we look at what uh, the Insight 2050 tells us about population growth, those are people that have to eat, right? So you think about population, you have to think about how do we feed that new group who now is going to make more choices because they're an educated consumer. And you now have a group, a, a whole business in terms of organic growth, craft beer, all of this, organic, that's a whole industry, that's business. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just a different type of business. And it has a, probably a more of a, a, a social benefit in addition to the business than some of the others because now we have to feed people and we have to make sure that there's access in every part of the city. And how do we do that and continue to make it a, a healthy proposition for them, access to healthy food? So that becomes the intersection of agriculture and urban, which becomes urban farming. And that whole movement we have to pay attention to. And I've been in so many rooms where um, having a discussion about it, people, oh, yeah, yeah, they need to eat. So you figure out how to feed those folks. And then you have a whole farm and table movement. So you have restaurants and the innovation that's happening in some of those kitchens. They're hunger, hungry for something less than five miles away as an ingredient to what they're creating in their kitchen and that's the new niche everybody's asking where are you sourcing your food from and what better proposition than say that i've got it f less than five miles away from the restaurant yeah. i mean you can't beat that level of nutrition you can't uh, beat that economic spend that's happening that's cycling throughout the city you can't beat it when it comes to food because it is one of those industries that can just really spark a lot of growth in my day job, we have an urban farm. We're farm raising fish, and it's a social enterprise. So there's all kind of ways around agriculture. And Ohio, the heart of it all, agriculture is, is our humble beginnings. And so I think that when we think about how do we integrate those two, we can't just think about it as just growing things. It is the business side of it. The social side is we have a population that we have to feed. They're going to be making smarter choices about their food because we've been telling them that for the last 10 years. Get healthy, get healthy. You know, so now people are asking for it, so now we have to deliver on that. You know, um, as we talk about people are biking, ri bike riding, so they're making healthier choices how they get around. They're going to make healthy choices how and what they eat and where they eat. And so we have to accommodate all of that. And uh, when we were moving on the car sharing legislation as well as the food truck legislation, which um, were part of my last two years, I ate some reef food trucks, taxis, and car sharing <laughs> 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 all in one year. And just in one year, you're talking policies that had been around forever that we had to now look at quickly so we could support growing businesses in two industries that we may not have tapped into for a long time left alone the taxi world, but now it becomes, now it's right in front of us. You got car sharing, which we didn't think about for many years. I mean, we still had carriages on the books in that same code section. Wow. You know, we're now updating to include car sharing and pedicabs, right? <laughs> so you, all of that is, you know, with a growing city and a young city like Columbus, those are questions that we have to begin to develop answers for that is engaging 
to business and to the end user who's going to select a pedicab over driving their car. So those are those are those um, happy problems I call them because it's a sign of us growing as a city and as a region. When we can do that, that lends to the discussions that we would have, so the region can continue to grow and embrace those things. May not look the same way, but certainly we can share about widening roads as something we would have in common. And they can inform us on how do we blend this urban farming together because it will be something we have to do because of the population growth. We have to feed all those people. They want to eat, and we have a responsibility to make sure they can. So we, uh, we have just a couple minutes left, and uh, you've learned that uh, we're an intelligent community. Hopefully <laughs> not just top seven, top one. We're, we're a hungry community that loves to eat, <laughs> and we're also very concerned about really? loss of farmland. <laughs> so yeah. and and we're, own crops. And we're, we're inexplicably content, but I, I think we're also very optimistic about using what, what tools we have to make sure that we can add a half million people and still be hungry, content, and, and, and raring to go. So I thought maybe for a last question, we could just real quick ask each, each person what they're most optimistic about in terms of uh, Columbus and Central Ohio growing. And uh, you, know, you can dream a little, but uh, maybe we'll get it done. And I, I'll go first to help you out. And I, I think that the tools that we have in place now really will allow us to tackle transportation challenges differently. Um, density, walkability, healthy living, all of that uh, is happening uh, because of market forces and demographic forces. And I think what we're in a moment here in Central Ohio to really do some, some new things, some really interesting things, and really put our technology to the test. So I'm, I'm optimistic about that. And maybe John? I, I'm optimistic about seeing how technology continues to change the way we do things. Even something like food trucks. That's not possible without mobile technology. You know, someone needs to know where the food truck is. Mm -hmm. The vendor needs to say where they are. So without our smartphones, like, okay, that, that business model may not work so well. And, you know, on the economic side, it changes, it has changed the way that real estate works. You know, the, the demand for office space, retail space has shrunk over time because of technology. And real estate, I mean, you see this on the housing side, I'm sure, Mark, is, is no longer just a commodity, but you have to add amenities and quality around it. And that speaks for the, the region as a whole. Um, technology will also have a bearing on transportation. A lot of the issues we're talking about in terms of potential congestion or even getting workers to their jobs. We see places like Rickenbacker, the New Albany Personal Care and Beauty Campus. They're wrestling with issues, trying to work out with CODA how to get workers to their facilities. and you know, maybe tr tr technology, whether it's driverless buses or, or some sort of mobile technology could play in part of the solution. I think the local food movement is probably the thing I'm most excited and optimistic about. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, it's and, and just something that we haven't, <laughs> that we haven't touched on is, um, is just the local foods in our schools and um, that sort of thing. Uh, we've worked hard on um, and moving towards that, and I just think that um, the the local foods and the business opportunities and the social impacts behind it, it, it embraces the everything that we we stand for as a, a community in the middle of our agricultural um, area. So very optimistic about it. Um, I would say to you, I am probably very optimistic about how we diversely fulfill our promise. Um, we will need to address diversity in every area of our city. How people live. Um, how they navigate the city, how diversely we have uh, in terms of our business landscape, how diverse we'll become when it comes to technology, how diverse we are in our thinking. Um, I think that I'm very excited about that because I think that diversity of thought is what's going to make sure that we fulfill our promise to every resident in our city. And I think all of that diversity in our thinking is going to get us there. I guess I'm optimistic about our optimism. So, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, no, I mean, you know, having grown up here, and we continually pinch ourselves, and, and we drink a lot of the local Kool Aid mm -hmm. because clearly our, our hearts here were hometown boys and uh, girls and uh, an organization. But really, when you when you step back, and, and I, I think I'm 
told this when my father retired down to Austin, Texas in the early uh, 2000s, we, we felt compelled that we had to go to other markets to, to find success. And when we started looking around to some of those other markets that had a vibe, we, we noticed early on how, how similar uh, characteristics were here. And, and so we kind of doubled down and, and we're really seeing the, the rewards of that. And when you look at, if we have the background and the, the livability and when the youth is this happy living here um, without the flash of, of, of Nashville or the music, but people really love to live here. And then you see what opportunities we have in areas like Ohio State where there's 700 acres in walkable distance to some of these great neighborhoods and a research university and Battelle, and that's just sitting there untapped. And so when you talk about expanding employment on, in, in in real estate opportunities like that, that are already embedded into these neighborhoods and this vibe that we have, you know, we we have we got a lot of gas in the tank, so we're really excited about our future. And with that, uh, any any closing questions or remarks? Well, you didn't ask me what I was optimistic. Well, about. oh, that's right. I'm sorry. Well, I'll 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 look at it from a global basis because sure, yeah. that's kind of what we do and. Um, you know, there's that old phrase, as Ohio goes, so goes the nation. Well, in a lot of ways, as Columbus and Ohio go, so goes the rest of the world. And there's something that's happening here that, again, we see in the great cities. I've got the tie-on of the city of Sweden, uh, Stockholm, which was the 2009 Intelligent wow. Community of the Year. So we, we, we got to get you a Columbus tie. Well, so we'll I, on I only, I, yes, I, I only wear ties of Intelligent Communities of the Year, just so you know. And that's why I'm wearing it. Not look, not to rub it in. You purple, but you look great in scarlet and gray. Right. <laughs> Somehow I knew he'd say that. That's right, that's right. Um, but in terms of why I, why I say that, there uh, obviously is something happening here, and they, and they said it much more articulately than I could. But there's, you're also creating something that uh, is called the triple helix, right? There's a, there's a new DNA that's being created from, from the old Columbus. And it has a lot to do with the collaboration that's, that's in the process, not perfected yet here, uh, among the local government, the academic or the intellectual class, and the private sector. And to the degree to which those three form a new strand, mm -hmm. then you get the kind of things that you want here. You get that kind of expression. Mm -hmm. And Columbus is, for whatever reason, and Dublin does well as well, I mean, you've gotten out ahead on this. You're, a top, you're one of the seven most intelligent communities on Earth. Mm -hmm. So the rest of the world watches this. And I believe that, again, if, if we can, if you can take that and continue to leverage that, then it helps us out as we go around the world and we tell the cities and the communities and the small villages that want to be Columbus, this is how they did it. They weren't always on the top of the game. You know, they had some rough years, but they did it. They got it done. That inspires other communities around the world. Again, that ultimately helps you when that happens. So, uh, I'm optimistic about that part of what you're doing. Well said, and uh, we're, we're uh, just so thankful for you to have been in uh, Columbus this week. And we know that we're optimistic, but we're hungry to be the top community. So uh, no, 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 that's right. No, no pun intended. But uh, thank you to our, our panelists. And uh, with that, we'll conclude our Intelligent Community Forum. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> You have been watching the Intelligent Community Forum Roundtable discussion on urban and rural planning. Its purpose was to discuss Columbus's policies and achievements for Lou Zaccarilla, co-founder of the Intelligent Community Forum, to find out more about the ICF and Columbus's place in the competition. You can visit their website at intelligentcommunity.org.